Audible is audio entertainment that entertains, educates, and inspires. For you, listeners of Creep Geeks Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash cheapgeek. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheapgeek for your free audiobook. Hello and welcome to Creepy Geeks Podcast, Season 5, Episode 216. In this episode, Cryptozoology and Paranormal Museum, Littleton, North Carolina, and Medic Mountain, and the Oz Factor. Yeah. So it begins again. Welcome back to the podcast. If this is your very first time tuning in, we're glad to have you here. And if you're a repeat offender, good to see you. Yeah. Okay, so we got a lot of stuff to talk about. And the first thing to talk about is we were thinking about moving the day of the podcast broadcast to Friday. <laughs> okay. So, you know, it really doesn't matter so much when you do a podcast as far as when the date that you listen to it actually happens. But the date of upload and or availability is something a little bit different. Yeah. So anyway, been kind of kicking around the idea. Normally we do it and it's available like on Mondays or whatever, but we're going to try something a little bit different. So we have skipped the previous day and now we're working on the Friday. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So depending on when you download the podcast, depends on when it happens. Like I said, it's not really anything that's different for the listener. It either is going to be available to you earlier than you're expecting or later than you expected. (laughs) See? Gotta, Welcome to my TED Talk. Yeah. Got to push the positives there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for some people, that may be good. For some people, it may not be good. Some people like to start the week with the podcast. Some people like to end the week with the podcast. Some people just don't, you know, really care and listen to it whenever they want at their leisure. Some people want to roll into the weekend with something weird to listen to. Yeah. yeah. Some people store a bunch up and then send us comments about stuff that happened like a month ago. And we have to go, what are they talking about? Yeah. <laughs> it's cool, man. It's all good. Yeah. So anyway, this particular podcast is about all sorts of stuff that we find to be interesting primarily on the internet and through our investigatory adventures. We have a DIY camper van that we use for these investigatory adventures. And we've been slowly sort of converting it from what it was to the way it is now. Uh, It's been a little bit of a process. So, you know, we did a different bed setup and we got storage and, you know, all that stuff. And it needs to suit multiple purposes. We're making it into a multi-purpose type investigatory vehicle. Adventure mobile. That's what I said. Uh huh. Of destruction. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, uh, we went through. We did a bunch of different things. We put some curtains up, and we got some, um, well, bed storage area all figured out. And we got everything sort of ready to go, and decided to take a quick trip. Yeah. Down to a little place in North Carolina, and do like a little, you know, sort of shakedown cruise for the van uh, slash little. We really would turn into kind of a little bit of a day trip. Um, yeah. And, you know, a little adventure. So we're going to tell you about that in just a second. Because we don't want to give away too much. Uh, we do like to start the podcast with a bunch of different informational type things. We do have a Facebook page and a web page and all that stuff. Where you can follow us and listen. And partake of all the fun. And we have links for that. And everything we talk about in our show notes. Uh, we have a website if you want to find... All the stuff we talk about in that link format where you can click and do whatever you want. And it's called creepgeeks.com. Yes. Uh, the Facebook page, which we're pretty active on, is called Creep Geeks Podcast. See how hard this is? If you'd like to follow us on Instagram and see some of the amazing photographic pictures we take, you can find it on Instagram at Creep Geeks Pod. Yes. So <laughs> uh, we do TikToks. Yeah. Which are fun, little fun videos, little clips, if you will. And you can find us on TikToks as Creep Geeks. Podcasts. See how this goes? Yeah. So you can pretty much find us anywhere. And we do have a phone number. If you'd like to share with us a story or maybe something you'd like us to talk about or a comment or a question or something like that, we have a phone number. And that phone number is? 
575-208-4025. Yeah. It's a Roswell area code in case you're interested. Yeah. It's a voicemail, so leave a voice message. We'd appreciate it. Yeah. So there you go. All right. So we're going to move into the podcast and talk about something that's very important. Okay. You know what it is? No. It's the 14 term of the day. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and what this is, this is typically a term or definition associated with the 14 or 40 on. Or paranormal. Or, or yeah, whatever. just like the weird stuff that we like to talk about. Yeah. And investigate. Because we are a paranormal and weird news podcast. Yeah. And we do investigatory stuff as well. So this 14 term of the day is eerie silence phenomenon. Now, this one took me two weeks to find because I was trying to figure out what it was called. Should have went with loud boom effect. True. That's my favorite. Yeah, but this one, it it took me forever to find the terminology because I kept typing in the way I interpreted the interpreted the experience but this definition for eerie <laughs> wait, wait are you like i'm having an eerie silence phenomenon no i was like when it makes when you have no noise right before a bigfoot encounter or just an encounter in yeah general. or and then i put when it's silent during a ufo abduction <laughs> you know and i couldn't find the right term mm. finally uh, through some tweaking and trying to like reach out to other people, I came upon eerie silence phenomenon. Now, the best description I found, because there's a lot of different descriptions that I don't totally agree with, including this one. Uh, This one is off Obscure Urban Legend Wikia, or Wiki. So I don't know what this site does, but basically their definition is fair, and it's the name given to an acoustic phenomenon that manifests as dead silence in areas where such silence would be unusual, such as forests. The phenomenon is also associated with all kinds of adjacent paranormal phenomenon, including UFOs, cryptids, and something called panic in the woods, which we should probably talk about in a whole separate podcast. Okay. Yeah. Well, this... Um, website also refers to the Oz factor as being, you know, combined with the eerie silence phenomenon. Um, the Oz factor includes non-silence experiences or experiences that include intelligent interactions. And we'll talk about the Oz factor later or in a bit. But eerie silence phenomenon, you will... It's not commonly referred to directly. It's usually... Uh, accompanying a paranormal experience. Hmm. So somebody will be like, you know, I was all alone in the house and it was deathly silent and that's when I saw the ghost. Or I was hiking all by myself or just me and somebody were hiking and it got super quiet and that's when I saw Bigfoot. That's that phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. We should just give it an acronym like ESP. Oh, wait. (laughs) (laughs) Like, dang, that's already taken. Yeah. Now, my my biggest concern and argument with this was while I was trying to find a definition to share with the listeners, people kept grouping in other stuff with with this, which makes me feel like nobody's clearly defined the phenomenon, or maybe it's still not. Well, I think this well. is one of those things where you just can't you yeah. can't clearly define a phenomenon. Okay. Because it doesn't always happen. True. And a lot of times, if you're experiencing stuff, you don't even know how quiet it is until after you think about it. And then you can't really say when it happened. Yeah. You know? So, I don't know. You know, because you could also look at, like, the calm before the storm. You know, that sort of, just sort of. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not quite the same because the calm before the storm just means, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything got quiet. But like this I- is the problem I have, uh, I have with a lot of these terms is that they try to, you know, encompass a, a, a bunch of different phenomena that may or may not occur, different types of phenomena and all that sort of thing. And give it one label. Yeah, yeah, and it gets so muddy that it doesn't necessarily apply. So when you're looking to sort of put the definition to it in a way that makes sense or a way that properly defines your experience, it doesn't work. Yeah, like we'll, we'll talk about part of the Oz factor yeah. late, later on, but I found one website that tried to include for eerie silence phenomenon the – when your breath shows up in a haunted house and the temperature drops as being part of the phenomenon. I'm like, that has nothing to do with (coughs) sound, you know? So that was my biggest hang up with that 14 term. 
Yeah, and that's that's part of the issue I I have with like I said like with some of these, but yeah, I mean I can see grouping things that occur, right, to try to give you sort of a set of criteria. Yeah, but you wouldn't necessarily use eerie silence phenomenon. I think yeah. for like the seeing the breath and the cold temperature drop, or you know, a ramp up of activity when you you know you know and, all that sort of thing. And I would group all of that into high strangeness, you know, almost. Yeah. So. Yeah, so that's mm. your 14 term of the day. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Well, speaking of the uh, eerie silence phenomenon, yeah, um, I've recorded a phenomenon that occurs every 17 years and I thought was pretty strange. Okay. Yeah, so let's go ahead and play it real quick, and that way you can kind of get an idea of what we're going to talk about. I played it twice just to be annoying. Yep. <laughs> okay, so these cicadas or cicadas or whatever you want to call them, they occur, right? They happen, and when I was reading up on these things, I hear them all the time. I feel like I hear them every summer, right? Mm-hmm. And my thought was is that I hear them every summer, but you're not supposed to be able to, I guess, hear them every summer. It's supposed to be like this cycle thing, right? Yeah. Like every 17 years or whatever. And I found this article from the Yakima Herald because it seemed whatever. It had a, it had a picture of a cicada looking thing, so that's pretty yeah. much why I picked it, right? <laughs> and the article goes, nature at its craziest trillions, with a T, yeah. of cicadas are about to emerge. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was thinking about it. I was like, wait a minute. And according to the AP, uh, Columbia, Maryland, sifting through a shovel load of dirt in a suburban backyard, Michael Ropp and uh, Paula Shrewsbury find their quarry, a cicada nymph. Hmm. And then another, and then another, and then four more. And then they said, in, 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 effectively, in a third of a square foot of dirt. Yeah. Which is weird. A third of a square foot, right? Yeah. Uh, they found at least seven cicadas at a rate just shy of one million per acre in a nearby yard, and, right? Yielded a rate closer to 1.5 million. Oh, no. And there's more. Trillions of the red eyed black bugs are coming. This, this is my horror movie to me. Within days, a couple weeks at most, the cicadas of Brood X. Yeah. And the X is the Roman numeral for 10. Thank you for, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Will emerge after 17 years underground. Uh, there are many broods of these periodic cicadas that appear on rigid schedules in different years, but this one is one of the largest and most notable. Oh, no. Yep. Uh, they'll be in 15 states from Indiana to Georgia to New York, and they're coming out in mass numbers in Tennessee and North Carolina. Uh, oh, this this sentence is horrifying. This is why I put it in here. When the entire brood emerges, backyards could look like undulating waves, and the bug chorus is lawnmower loud. Y'all can't see me because this is an audio podcast, but I'm wringing my wrists in uncomfortableness right now. Stop. <laughs> I can't hear you because the waves of undulating <laughs> cicadas. <laughs> So there you go. I can't. It's one of nature's weirdest events featuring sex, a race against death, evolution, and what can sound like a bad science fiction movie soundtrack. Facts. Some people, Omi, may be repulsed. <laughs> right? And psychiatrists, oh, psychiatrists, <laughs> psychiatrists are calling uh, entomologists worrying about their patients. And they say, you know, effectively, but scientists were saying that the arrival of Brood X is a sign uh, that despite, uh, despite pollution, climate change, and a dramatic biodiversity loss, something is still right with nature. Wait, they didn't explain the psychiatrist. No, about they didn't. Patients. They're I just c- calling up saying, hey, I'm a psychiatrist. These cicada things that are coming out, 
what are they going to do to my patients? Yeah. I don't think you need a psychiatrist to think that if you've seen waves of these things whizzing through the, your yard, lawnmower loud, it'd be kind of creepy. So in the 80s, I I was living, my parents had a house very close to a lake in Virginia, very humid environment, and we had one of these en masse cicada summers. And even though I was a little kid, I think I had like a full bout of insomnia that entire summer because I just couldn't sleep because it was so loud and it bothered me so much. Mm. And as an adult, it still bothers me. Like I, there are some very humid nights here in the South where I can't sleep because I can hear that sound and it unnerves me. The same thing. Stop it. (laughs) Like, like when crickets, when the humidity is super crazy and they get really loud, same problem. In the southwest, it was locusts where, oh, I can't. Certain auditory phenomenon mess me up. Yes. So there you go. And now here's the deal. You get a creature that spends 17 years in a uh, COVID-like existence under the ground, right? Mm-hmm. And then they're going to do the best they can to effectively breed and then do it all again. So what they do is they, uh, they come out of the ground, they sort of dry out a little bit. They shed that skin they get their wings. They go up to the treetops to escape predators. And, but this is, this is a good little sentence right here that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. Once in the treetops, Hey, it's all going to be about romance. (laughs) Right. Yeah. It's only the males that sing, and it's going to be a big boy band up there as the males try to woo those females, try to convince that someone special uh, that she should be the mother of his nymphs. <laughs> he's going to perform. He's going to sing songs, and if she likes it, right, she's going to click her wings. Okay. And then they're going to have some wild sex in the treetop. <laughs> so classy. I know. <laughs> it's like uh, you know when I first read this article. Because I glanced at it real quick, and you know you can kind of get the pacing and everything. I get to this point, and it's almost like they took a break for a while. <laughs> you know, maybe a day or two, whatever, and came back. Maybe they watched the movie or something, and came back, and then wrote wrote the rest of it. Because I was like, do 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 do, you know. And then they're gonna have wild, wild sex in the treetop. As a content writer, I can relate to that, though. Yeah, we've you, all done that. Take you start off super out. serious, and then you're like, you know what? <laughs> start out strong, and then you kind of take a break and forget the real message you were going for. I'm like, well, well I'm let's go this. with insect boy bands. <laughs> yeah, or you start out strong, and you come back, and you go, man, that looks like, what did that, that looks, that's garbage. That's not as good as I thought, so, yeah. Uh, then she's going to move up to the small branches. She's going to lay her eggs, and then it's going to be all over in a matter of weeks, and they're going to tumble down, and they're basically going to fertilize the very plants from which they were spawned. Six weeks later, these tiny nymphs uh, are going to tumble 80 feet from the treetops, bounce once or twice, burrow down in the soil, and go back to uh, hanging out underground for 17 years. Yeah. And it's one of the craziest life cycles of any creature on the planet. It, it is very cryptid or horror. I yeah. mean, you have this monster that comes out of the ground, breeds, creates new life, only to have that new life go back underground, lurking and waiting for... Another seventeen years, yep. and then they they don't even eat. Yeah, they, they have like they can sing, but they got no mouth. So much. Yeah, um, and they fly around all crazy, and then your dog gets them and they're flying around with a bumblebee the size of a clothespin or a, a small hamburger, and its mouth whizzing around making noise. I remember one time at work, <laughs> out back it was late. We used to work the night shift, hanging out uh, in the back loading dock area, and. One of those things was just kind of whizzing around back there, all scary. And it stopped. And dude said, well, guess that one's dead. And he went over and nudged it with its foot. And that thing took off, <laughs> like right at him. Scared him real bad, too. He ran to the back door and he couldn't get in because you have to use a badge to get in the back door. Yeah. <laughs> just, he was like, I guess it wasn't dead, man. So, I think the worst. Was oh, it. I laughed so hard. And then he, he got mad at me and he went in and he slammed the door. And I'd realized at that point I had forgotten my badge <laughs> and I could not get in. And there's like very few people in the building and he would not answer his phone. Oh. So I was out there for 
a long time. Mm. And then he finally went looking for me. I was like, dude, you locked me outside with this crazy bug. <laughs> so. I think the worst is because we've actually had this happen where the dog gets one. Yeah, he's like, Rrr. brings it inside but won't open his mouth. Just yeah. sitting there with cacada bubble gum. <laughs> he's just buzzing <laughs> around. <laughs> And I have friends who have cats, and the cats will bring them in only to release them the moment moment they walk into the house. Like, yeah. oh, here's something for you. I don't like these things, and and it bothers me because, like you were saying, why do we hear them every single summer when the next sentence in this article says, America is the only place in the world that has periodic cicadas that stay underground for either 13 or 17 years. So... To me, I'm reading that sentence thinking, okay, we should have a break. And yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember having not heard them, it seems like, every year. I don't know. Yeah. Kind of one of those things. They're a cryptid. Maybe it's the Mandela effect. <laughs> you think you hear them all the time and you really don't. Yeah. So moving back into the podcast, something else to talk about. We did some things and, uh, well, we went to Littleton, North Carolina. Right? Mm-hmm. And we went down there because we were taking a trip to Medic Mountain State Park. Yeah. Because there's supposed to be Bigfoots down there. Um, And we should also say that we stopped by the Cryptozoological Paranormal Museum. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry, I have to say, just watching the dog have a nightmare. <sighs> Looked like she was full running. It's a, Poor baby. Yeah, she has a little chair. In the Creep Geek studio where she, it's, anyway, this is what it is. Yeah. Okay, so we went down there primarily to kind of see what's going on and see what's going on at the Paranormal Museum and to see what's going on with Medic Mountain and to test the van. Yeah. So, there you go. <laughs> well, okay, so first, we're saying Medoc Mountain, Medoc Mountain. Medic is what Medic. I was saying, yeah. But we, depending on who we talked to, they were either like Medoc or medic, you know, so we couldn't get a straight answer on that. Different people were saying different things. I'm going to say Medic Mountain. Um, it's it's a nice park, nice clear trails. Small. Small, I will say that. Uh, campsites are closer together, so you're not traveling too far to park your camper or set up a, a campsite or whatever. But it's, it's small and it's nice. Um, trails are clear. We do have some video that's going live soon for our Patreon members. Um, the trails were really quiet. No, well, see, okay. Yeah. So that's the whole thing. And that's the reason why you put the eerie, yeah. eerie, uh, uh, silence. What was it called? Uh, <laughs> eerie silence phenomenon. Yes. That was my and thing. And that was, and, and the funny thing was, is that that's something, okay. Talking about the campsite and all that. Cause there's campsites, there. I think there's like 22 of them or whatever. And you can have horses and it's, it's kind of a, a neat little place. Yeah. I didn't notice how quiet it was until after you mentioned something about how quiet it was. And then at that point I realized how loud we were. <laughs> I mean, we weren't trying to make noise, yeah. but you know, doing dumb stuff like backing up three times and, you know, making little circles around the place, trying to figure out where we're supposed to be. That had to be super loud. Yeah. I don't know. And I, so it made me a little self-conscious like, well, you know, that's, it is what it is. I mean, we didn't play any music. We didn't do anything crazy like that. We uh, actually watched, we got there late, my fault, um, and it was dark, and we got there, and we pulled in, and we pulled straight in and uh, watched The Expanse Yeah, on sci-fi on my phone just sitting in the front seat. So they probably thought, whoever was watching us, because I'm sure, you know, people at campsites are nosy, they they want to peep they probably thought we were just really weird that we never got out yeah so we pulled in and watched the expanse for like an hour um yeah we never got out so they probably thought what the hell's going on i mean i got out a couple times go go to the bathroom take but that was afterwards though we pulled in and just didn't do anything yeah you know are you kicking my feet under the table unfortunately you're creeping me out man because i'm playing the the bug sounds and you're there (laughs) kicking my feet but yeah, it was the the quietness. It was funny for me. I didn't hear as much quietness at the campground, but I did notice everybody was making an effort to not be too noisy. Yeah, it was weird. Except for because w- later on, when I was walking around, 
some people at the group campsites were a little loud, and that's to be expected. But it was, I think it was like a boy. It was still the quietest campsite we've ever been to. Which is saying a lot because, you know, we were camping. Okay, our next quietest campsite was in a place called um, Joe Skeen yeah. uh, Campground. It had eight sites. It's in this little tiny little box canyon. It had two vault toilets, and then you're in a box canyon. And it's very small. So it's like being inside a deep bowl. But still the campsites were farther apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and there was more room in between sites, and that's okay. But, you know, somebody went to use the bathroom, and it was like this giant echo cannon. <laughs> Remember? Yes. I mean, it was like, re- it, was, it was, it was so loud that I thought somebody was messing with us, like, a, like in there, just making the loudest possible fart noises they possibly know, could. But they so were bad. not, you know. And it was right then that I was like, you know what? We should make it a note to never bring chili on a co- like on a in a camp, like to go camping or whatever. Yeah. It was just there was no hiding it. It was just like an echo. It was funny. Yeah. And it was sad, too, because at that point we were like, man, if we do have a stomach problem, we're going to have to leave our campsite and go someplace civil, like a subway. Yeah, because you, you, you would be heard. <laughs> or McDonald's. It was, like, it was embarrassing. <laughs> you know, you know there's only eight sites, and everybody's going to know you're there. Yeah. You know. But this place, uh, nice. They had hot showers. They had um, full bathrooms. Nice setup there. But, again, quiet. Very quiet. So I went hiking. um, the next day when I woke up and took Pepper for a, a hike on about two and a half trails. And the thing that bothered me the most was, despite having a full campground, not many people on the trail. I only see, saw maybe like five people total. Um, and it was quiet. Unusually creepily quiet. And as lush as that place was, as far as, you know, um, plants, water, stuff like that. I expected more wildlife, and I didn't get it. There was not a lot of wildlife out there while I was hiking. Um, and there were moments where there's just nothing but silence. I didn't see not one bird. Yeah, I no, I saw three total. Yeah, but, but I mean, yeah, you know, you know, we can look out the window and see ten, fifteen, twenty birds. It's like it was just it was weird. Yeah, it was quiet. Uh, people were doing their own thing. There's really nothing to do there except to go walk the trails. But the thing is, is that uh, people have reported seeing signs of sisquich out yeah. there. And it's also been reported that uh, people have traded things, you know, left little gifts and that sort of thing and had interactions and found footprints um, out there. And so basically seen sign uh, that this has been sort of an active area Um. You know, see Sasquatch. Yeah. Or to see evidence that there may be something more out there than what you'd expect. And see, and it's not actually a mountain. Yeah. It's like... <clears throat> it's a high <clears throat> concentration of basalt that has been slowly eroding away since, I guess, the Appalachian Mountains stopped being the major geological... Um, yeah, so you're, just, you're basically at the, the tallest part of a flat... Yeah. area it really is what it boils down to yeah. it's, it's it's covered so it's not like you're gonna go to get to the top and have this amazing view you know like in the blue ridge parkway you can see mountains or out in the southwest where you can see mountains but yeah it's heavily treed you know and there's natural <sighs> aquifers everywhere there's that means water of, tons yeah, of water tons of water in fact uh, that's in the video that'll be going live to the patreon people because there's something unusual about that water yeah um, when we went to the museum, we actually talked a little bit about that water and the aquifers too. Um, it's everywhere and it's just barely, you just scratch the surface and suddenly, you know, there's water everywhere. It, it would be a great place to maintain like a Bigfoot or a large predator, but there's not, I didn't see enough wildlife. In that spot. Yeah, in that particular spot. Yeah, I, it, it was kind yeah. of a weird, weird thing. And, you know, it kind of, people would probably look at it and go, well, how can there be Bigfoot here? Or, you know, it, I hate to use the word squatchy because mm-hmm. it just bugs me. But it's like, oh, you know, it doesn't appear to be too squatchy. But at the same time, though, I can totally see how um, something could survive out there. There's plenty of water. There's stuff to eat. There's, you know, um, there's, 
there's plenty of stuff to eat out there if you're really looking for it, if you're in that environment, you know. And a lot of times I think we think that, you know, Bigfoot needs like a a large supply of, you know, deer to eat and, you know, whatever, like supplies, right? Like he needs like deer and some berries and some rabbits and all that sort of thing. When really there's no real, you know, like Miser Farms close by, get him a chicken, yeah, you know. Maybe some garden foods or whatever, but I mean, all that stuff I'm sure is out there. But oh, we did see the two deer. Remember, like when we were trying to find the campsite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, I remember yeah. seeing, and they were weird and quiet. Too. I don't know. It's just it, it was kind of an eerie thing to be there. It was a nice place. We'll we'll go back there again. Yeah. Um, to be honest, though, I enjoyed more of being in the cryptozoological and paranormal museum yeah that so was... you get a little concentrated experience <clears throat> yeah um yeah maybe concentrated is not a not a good word so you kind of have to describe the situation here all right so the oldest house in littleton houses this cryptozoological and paranormal museum yeah right and steve owns it mm-hmm. and runs it and lives there and Steve basically is um, part of the town officials. You know what I mean? He's, he's, um, he serves as a county commissioner. Yeah. He's the county commissioner. I'm just, I'm trying to, okay. So he's the county commissioner. He cares about the town. He runs around and does the stuff that he's supposed to do for the town. Um, he's active. People can reach out to him and contact him. And he's, he's a, he's in it. And he's a good resource. You know, he's not checked out when it comes to this sort of thing. A lot of times you meet, like, city officials, and they're just kind of like, you feel like they're just kind of going through the motions or whatever, and they're glad-handing you. Yeah. But I get the feeling if you call Steve and say, I have a problem, he's going to look into it or try to take care of it and at least get back to you. Yeah. And that goes a long way. So he lives in that house, right? And and the, the cool thing is is that the crypto, cryptozoological and paranormal stuff is in the front of the house, and the back of the house is his, is his dwelling. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's got his family there. Um, and he's got some pretty neat stuff, and he's got some haunted items that are in there as well, and so, you know, some para- paranormal stuff because he does paranormal stuff as well, right? Mm-hmm. And there's some Bigfoot stuff. And the paranormal tours that he wants to get started again, which, yeah. Yeah, and so the tours, and so it's kind of like in this one little place, to be fair, all right, and, and you know, I'm not trying to... I would not go to Littleton at all if it was not for that. There's yeah. no reason to go to Littleton. Uh, <clears throat> from the perspective of two people who have traveled to many small towns throughout rural America and the United States, I can understand your position. Yeah, because I would not pop off the highway to go to Littleton, you know, Yeah. if it was not for the Cryptozoological and Paranormal Museum. I'm just being honest. Yeah. You know, because there's there's things to do in the area. You have, like, Lake Gaston, which is a big deal because it's a big lake and a lot of people like it and stuff like that. But Littleton has this awesome little cryptozoological and paranormal museum, and it fits the town. It's small. It's, it's you know, in the oldest house there. You know, you've got paranormal stuff. You've got Bigfoot stuff. You've got somebody who as, is in touch with the town and is in, in the town as yeah. a fixture. Whether he wants to keep being that fixer or not, it's really up to Steve, you know. But anything else, I wouldn't necessarily be there for. And I just think it's kind of a it's it's a unique little little place. And Steve's a really nice guy. Uh, I sat and talked to him for like two or three hours. Yeah, <laughs> and which is great because you know we had good interactions. We talked about all sorts of things, and he's a very interesting fellow. And I think we're gonna have him on the show one day. I just give him a call because he's he's that kind of guy. I give him a call and say, hey, what's up? Yeah. Um, and he has like a pretty cool little church pew, and that, that's yeah. It, it's almost the equivalent of of having like a big porch swing, and just sitting there. You know what I mean? You sit on you sit on the front porch and just talk for hours, right? Well, it's kind of like that. Yeah. It's not. I mean, okay, it's not a literal porch. It's a church pew, but still. And he has videos, and he was showing us videos of some of the interactions he's had, um, in the town and some of the places they go and some of the stuff that he's experienced and. You know, the experiences that he brings and has and and shares with you, it's just, 
there's no charge for all that. He's just throwing it. You know, he enjoys it, right? Yeah. It's obvious. It's like this person. Yeah. And it's, in. it's a genuine interest that with his background, he has looked at, he has analyzed, he's researched, and he's presented in a very genuine manner. manner. So when we talk about like some of the, cause we did have, we did spend some time talking more about the paranormal stuff he was bringing it from a very authentic place. Yeah. So there was, it was really interesting seeing some of those details. And what, what I liked about the museum was that there was this little uh, TV and it would play details about some of the items in the haunted museum part. And then if you had further questions, which you were bound to, yeah. you talk to Steve and the next thing you know, he's opening his phone and he's showing, look what a lady took a picture of just, you know, two days ago. Yeah. Or this is one of the best pictures we got of the haunted doll doing some very crazy stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and that, that is something I really appreciate as a Yeah. To, I mean, it was yeah. like, it did because too often times, or I shouldn't say too often times, oftentimes we meet people and we talk to them and they, they give you a little bit, but for the most part, you're not going to get, it's almost like pulling teeth, try to get information <laughs> and stuff. You know, there's, there's a feeling out period where it's like, is this person, yeah, you know, a whack job or is, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's kind how of much weird tin sort of foil thing. are they wearing? Yeah. You know, and like how open to the, to, because, and you have to understand, I understand that a lot of people that do this sort of thing don't always want to talk about Bigfoot. They don't always want to talk about ghost stuff. They don't always want to talk about that sort of thing. Yeah. But at the same time, that's kind of why you're there. Yeah. Um, I didn't have any of those experiences at all. We, we talked to Steve uh, for a long time and we kicked around stuff and, <clears throat> excuse me, we talked about some of the people that we know in common and some of our shared experiences and that sort of thing. And it was just a good time. It was worth it. Yeah. It was worth the trip to go down there just to go to that museum. Yeah. Or at least it was for me. And while we were there, you know, people came in and out and it's still COVID and there's still COVID rules and stuff like that. You know, they would, they would pop in there and go, you know, Hey, I have a question. He'd answer the question as long as it took and, and all that sort of thing. And it, it was just, a, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, when we talked about the paranormal stuff and the haunted places that are around in the cemeteries and like, I do kind of want to, I want to go back, I guess, well, we'll be busy later on this year, but when they're able to kick back up those paranormal tours, I'd like to see one from him Yeah, because he's so knowledgeable about the history. Like he spent like a good 10 minutes giving me a good deep dive on the, the difference between the, the grave, the cemeteries out there. Yeah, and that's what I mean. You know, yeah. he's he's in he's in touch with the the history with the yeah, yeah the town. Yeah. You know, so he knows it. He knows the ins and outs and the comings and goings. Yeah, and uh, periodically he does, um, sort of these little adventures. You know, he'll he'll be at Medic Mountain. He'll be in the campsite, and there'll be people that show up, and people will go out and investigate and look, and you know, try to find stuff. And they go out there, and they have, um, you know, people from all over that are interested in that sort of thing and they'll show up and they use, you know, the, you know, the infrared and the heat technology and all that stuff. And he shares all the stuff. In other words, it was a good time. I had a good time there. We went, we, we chatted for a long time and we actually talked about everything from social media to Bigfoot's to, to his life as a journalist in New York. Yeah. And that's something that, yeah. you know, he's got the cryptozoological paranormal stuff right up front, but he also has this amazing sort of backstory. He's New York, New York, journalist covering celebrity news, serial murders and stuff. So he knows a lot of people, including Billy Joel. Yeah. You know, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And so he's got, and he's, he was doing the, you know, the investigations up there and doing that sort of thing. So he's, he's got this sort of, he's just an interesting cat. The whole thing was just an interesting time. Yeah. We talked about camper vans and stuff like that. And we showed him, you know, what we did with the camper van. And so it was just, it was a good time. We even talked about the air conditioning. Oh, and if you, if you, you know, that's a good split level, you know, and, we, <laughs> yeah. and it was just like, okay, I had a great time. It's like, we're, we're definitely going to reach out one, one day when he's not real busy and see if he wants to pop on the podcast. And that's the uh, other thing. If you listen to more than paranormal podcasts, if you listen to murder podcasts, he's a great resource too, because he was the journalist involved on the uh, Long Island serial murders. So you might actually hear him on some of these murder casts yeah. that are out there. So, and, yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a good guy. Yeah. Right, so I liked it. I enjoyed it. We had a good time. 
Uh, as far as Medic Mountain goes, uh, it's it was a cool place. I liked it. It was you know kind of quiet. It was the perfect place for us to test you know some of the changes that we'd made to the van. Our bed is great. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was just a it was a good little. It was a short trip. You know, we left Friday in the afternoon, got there like midnight, which is kind of like what you don't want to do. Yeah. Um, at the campsite, but at the end of the day, it's like I don't care. You know, we got lost as hell because we directions are awful. Oh my god! So we were coming to the. Let's state not make park. a big deal of it because then people think we can't find our way out of a paper bag. But you know, yeah. Google can kiss my buttocks <laughs> because it kept running us around where we needed to be, yeah. and it's just like I go through love hate relationship with Google mm-hmm. and Google Maps. Um, I don't even bother with Apple Maps or whatever that is because I just don't like it. Yeah. And an old crusty Garmin, which I think a lot of times just doesn't care. <laughs> and says, I will point you to where it is with the latitude and longitude, but it's up to you to figure it out. And then there's some there's some honesty with that. Yeah. But whereas Google, it just it just Google kept, running kept us trying around. to take us to somebody's backyard near a horse trail entrance. And we went there. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, that's cool. Now I get to back up my camper van 50 feet and hope get out on the road without running it. It's just a, it was aggravating. Yeah. But I think the trip was worth it. We're going to go back. I like some of the stuff he's got going on. Definitely interested in the paranormal side of things as well. Uh, the cryptid stuff, I, I kind of have an, an idea of what we'd want to do out there and how we want to set that up. But And that was another great thing about taking the van on a trial run because we had plenty of room in the van to... To do stuff. Yeah. Don't give away my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it was good. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, I think we're going to play a quick commercial. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Creep Geeks podcast. Audible is audio entertainment that entertains, educates, and inspires. For you, the listeners of the Creep Geeks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day free trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash cheapgeek. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheapgeek for your free audiobook. Enjoy this with your free trial. 30 days of membership free, plus two free audiobooks that are yours forever. One credit a month after trial, good for any book, regardless of price. Exclusive member savings, get 30% off additional audiobooks, easy exchanges, don't love a book, swap it for free, anytime, seriously. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheapgeek for your free audiobook today. Yeah, so... We went down there, we took a little trip, and we tested the van. It was a good, good little experience. We bought some chicken. Ate a bucket of chicken. Right? Hung out. Audible is audio. And we went through the town. I don't know why that was playing again. But anyway, went through the town. We went through some of the cemeteries and seen some really neat stuff. Um, one of the things I thought was kind of cool was, so before we took this trip, we kind of did a little research on the area and that sort of thing, right? Because you always got to look to see if the, if the place is going to be worth your time. Um, one of the videos I came across on YouTube was, and he has a YouTube channel, Steve. And he was riding through the town talking about some of the things he had to do as commissioner um, and some things that he was going to be working on, you know, as commissioner. And he was just showing the town and just talking while he was doing his, making his rounds, if you will, right? And so... By watching a couple of those videos, I got to kind of see the town and everything. I was like, this is going to be a fun little trip, you know? Yeah. And so basically, watching those videos and seeing this little town and seeing some of the areas that are may or may not be interesting, you know, like the cemetery and all that stuff, and he's kind of putting around in his truck doing his job. It's like, okay, I'm going to go down there just because I thought it was pretty cool. And those videos I thought was pretty interesting just in general. You know, because like he, instead of trying to use Google and do all the little research to kind of get a feel for the area, he's just showing you, giving you like a little tour. And I don't know. And so that sort of I thought was pretty interesting. And I think a lot of people do too. So if you check out his YouTube channel, we do have a link. Um, you can kind of see what we're talking about. So, so it's a sort of a low key fellow with this whole thing, Steve Barcello. So, yep. What? 
Uh, he also does uh, a lot of stuff on the Facebook for it. So yeah. there's an even mix of really good YouTube videos and also go on Facebook to see some of his like <clears throat> lives. So, yeah. Yep. So if you're in the Littleton, North Carolina area, you should definitely uh, check it out. Um, yeah, I know Bigfoot festivals and stuff like that is, you know, kind of happened in the past that really haven't happened to me because of COVID. Um, when they come back, if he has his down there in that area and brings in some of the big people that were there and have been there a couple times in the past, it, it's going to be fun to go to. Yeah. I, we're I, for I, sure going to go. Yeah. So. I anyway, just kind of want to wrap that up. So anyway, check them out. We have a link to Steve's stuff, and you can find them on Facebook as well. And, uh, yeah, show them a little, uh, little something. So if you're interested, it'll be kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. So the Oz factor was something you alluded to but didn't really go into because you said we'd go into it now. <laughs> Basically, right? Yeah, and I'm, I'm realizing now that if we explain it, we're probably going to end the podcast on a frustrating note because – it's annoying. I have been trying to find this this terminology, you know, to help the audience with the whole 14 term of the day because it is helpful. Right. But just finding and defining this term along with the eerie silence, it it was like falling into a rabbit hole of frustrating definitions when all I want to do is help not just myself but people who listen understand the paranormal in 14 worlds. The Oz factor is a term that was coined by ufologist Jenny Randles. The problem is, if you look outside of Jenny Randles and her research, people kind of slap this onto a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, the definition, according to Jenny Randles, you know, some UFO witnesses experience a sensation of being isolated or transported from the real world into a different environmental framework. I call this the Oz factor after the fairy tale land of Oz. Now this goes into discussions of before or after before, during and after a UFO abduction experience, people feel like they're in a constructed reality. Something's off. Everything looks normal, but something's off. It might be the eerie silence phenomenon, or it may be the way things are happening, like the trees are swaying outside differently. Something is off to the point where you feel like you've fallen into this fairy tale land or almost a different dim- dimension. So it's like being in a different construct. It's yeah. like it's created for you to try to keep you at ease or whatever, and it's just weirding you out because you know it's not right. Yes, and, and it's funny because like this goes back to like, when we listen to the Navajo Paranormal Rangers do a talk about how, you know, certain situations, the people were telling them, you know, I, I went to my house, but something was off. Yeah. Things weren't right. And you hear it talked about, but you never hear a label being applied to it. In this particular instance, the way Jenny Randles has defined it, it's, it's within the UFO phenomenon and how it's a construct. But people are labeling other things. As the Oz factor, and that's that's the frustrating thing I want to speak about. See, and that's the problem. Yeah. We have terminology and descriptions to describe things that occur. Yeah. But they just get so watered down because it's, you know, there's trying to describe all these different types of phenomena and everything that's been experienced by different people, different places, different times but use like a set of terminology and try to make it fit. It doesn't. And it winds up just sort of diluting the entire thing. Yeah. Cause to me, you know, the Oz thing would, the Oz factor would be like, you talked about the Navajo Rangers. Yeah. And they talked about a woman who had an experience with the UFO and she finally made it home. And when she got home and she got out of the car, there was like a three foot tall rabbit. White. Like a, yeah, like a, like a white jackrabbit just sitting there and she remember looking at it going, Oh, that's just kind of strange. And everything was sort of surreal and didn't necessarily apply. Yeah. And then come to find out she'd been gone like two hours longer than normal. Yeah. You know, um, or when people see stuff like the owl, right? The owl could be a messenger. It's this three foot tall owl sitting outside on a tree branch and they, people lost time and they experienced weirdness and everything was 
familiar to them and what they would expect, but it was all wrong. It was just something was off and you couldn't really put their fingers on it, you know? Yeah. That and, sort of thing. And the problem is when people are serious about this particular phenomenon, um, I'm pulling open another article now. It's about this guy, folklorist Peter Rossowitz, and he was recounting an experience in 1980 while working on a PhD dissertation that happened to be about UFOs. And he was talking about he was working in the library, had a strange encounter with a man who approached him um, while he worked and engaged him in conversation. As they talked about his dissertation on UFOs, the man suddenly shouted accusingly, flying saucers are the most important fact of the century and you're not interested? And then, you know, Rossowitz, he's just like, that's he's leaving. He's just leaving. He's like, what's wrong with that guy? What a weird experience. Yeah. He's like, this doesn't make sense. So he tries to return to his work and he has a feeling that things weren't right. So he gets up, he starts to wander around the library. He noticed there's no librarians, uh, no patrons, and the library is pretty much dead. So in a mild panic, he returns to his workspace, tries to calm down, Hour later, he leaves the library. Everything seems to be normal again. Yeah, so that's weird. Yeah. Now, that that's a very involved experience to describe one single terminology. So how do we get this one single terminology to describe a myriad of experiences ranging from this guy to, like, what the Navajo Rangers were telling us? You know? it's It doesn't fit. Yeah. I mean, and that's, it doesn't fit. Yeah. And I think in general, that's the problem we have with like paranormal stuff, UFO stuff, cryptid stuff. Nothing actually really fits. Everything is kind of like you have some commonalities that occur with all these things. Yeah. But th- there's so many other things that don't really fit. It's like, how can you, and that's, I think, and that's really part of the problem with the entire thing. I think we'll never really have any truly definitive answers for anything because it's always so amorphous. Yeah. You think you can wrap your arms around it, right, and get a good grip of what's going on. So, like, aha, this is how, you know, we're getting somewhere with it. And then it just gets, you know, it just turns into this bubble of crud that you can't hold on to because things change. And that's when. But. But. So, with our 14 term of the day and with talking about, you know, this whole little segment about um, the Oz factor, what I hope it stresses to people is that when these high strangeness symptoms, I guess, happen, pay attention to them. And because that's part of the greater phenomenon. Yeah. But don't latch on because I am noticing this in the community. Everybody right now is latching on to the word demon or latching on to, you know, oh, they'll they'll hear one, two, three, and they'll go, oh, that's a demon. <laughs> or, oh, that's a poltergeist. Yeah. But they're not listening to four, five, six, which might mean, is it a tulpa? Is it an overarching phenomenon stemming from something else? Well, I think a lot of times things get, just get discounted because it doesn't exactly match what you yeah. hear all the time as being like, oh, that's, you know. Like a good... Examples. So your your experience doesn't meet all the criteria, so you get pigeonholed off in a category of doesn't apply, mm-hmm. or it's not true, or whatever, when it's like, okay. And I think we're all kind of guilty of it, because you're looking for those little factors, those little sort of check marks, and your little roadmap of investigation that basically says, okay, this happened, this happened, this happened, so I can categorize it at this, and this is how I can wrap my head around it. When it wouldn't necessarily work. That's why you see some just some really weird and hear like really weird, crazy stories out there. Or really bold statements. Yeah. And you then know. people are like, oh, you know, that must be completely false. <laughs> you know, because it doesn't match anything that I know to be true. And at the end of the day, I don't think, it, I think part of the phenomenon that everybody experiences, I shouldn't say everybody, that a lot of people experience mm-hmm. is slightly tailored to you. Yeah. And it can be slightly different and tailored to someone else that may be with you. So you have a lot of factors that are the same, but there's a lot of details or the sort of the nuance of the entire, you know, experience that is really sort of tailored to you somehow. And that freaks and, and, me out. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm not by me any means the first one to think of this sort of thing. People actually say that, you know, these, hey, this experience has really sort of become more personal. Um. 
than what we would actually think. I'm trying to think of who actually brought it. So maybe it, it was Shannon Lagro kind of. Well, I mean, a lot. It, yeah. She, yeah. Oh, she's everybody's brought it up because, mm-hmm. you know, like I said, this is not a new thing. Yeah. Um, Keel said something similar to it. Yeah, I have that book. I still haven't cracked it enough to. Yeah, really but I that's, yeah. and I don't know if if it really is an experience that's being catered to you specifically, and you know, catered to somebody else specifically, or if it's just your mind's way of sort of reacting to the experience that's actually occurring. In other words, like say you're ca- say you're the the thing on the other end of it where you're causing someone to have an experience. Hmm. Like, how hard do they really have to work? to make it to where the experience you're having is catered to the individual to get the point across. I don't think they have to work that hard. I think they just need to tweak it a little bit in your own mind sort of helps to sort of fill in the gaps a certain way. Like if you went out into the woods and you didn't say a word because you were out there hiking, doing your own thing, maybe walking the dog, not talking or anything like that. And you hear something call to you from the woods in your own voice. How, how is that possible? If it's a physical being, right, like how would they be able to reach out and speak to you in your own voice? They have to be able to sort of tap into you a little bit in order to get that inference of, you know, what you're thinking, how you're going to react, or what's going to have the most impact on you. That's what I'm saying. You know, I don't think that um, they have to work too hard with it. Yeah. I think it's just somewhere they can sort of tap and go, okay, you know, have a general understanding. And people will be like, oh, but telepathy, you know, they can read your mind and stuff. Well, can they? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, nobody really knows. But I, I think mm-hmm. it's a little bit a little bit different. I think it's sort of easier than that, you know, for whatever's causing it. Maybe we're just not there yet. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to just, how are, to, are we? Yeah. I mean, when we are walking into or stepping into what will end result in a paranormal encounter, are we wearing those, those preconceived notions or what to expect on our sleeve? So the moment we walk into it is, is the UFO is the Bigfoot is the Tulpa is the ghost. Is it picking up on the fact that you're going to see a ghost or you're going to see a UF, an alien and I'm going to see a fairy, you know, that type of thing. Um, are you going to hear something different than I hear that type? That's how I'm perceiving it. Yeah. And yeah. does your intent and your willingness or openness or whatever, I mean, yeah. does any of that play into the ability of whatever's causing the experience to sort of make you have an experience, like whether it's the trickster element of things or whatever, uh, cause look at Skinwalker ranch, right? where different people had different experiences of whatever, whereas they would be like, you know, one guy would have one experience and the other person right beside him would have a completely different experience. Yeah. They, they both experienced something. You, you see what I'm saying? And a lot of people would call it like, like the trickster element. Like, Oh yeah, you're going to have something that's really sort of catered to you. But is it, is it even that way? Or is it just sort of a, uh, and in, in an innate thing that sort of happens, like if you put two magnets together, right, you have a positive side and a negative side, they attract each other. That's one thing, but you, know, you have a positive side and a negative side, right? They, they come together, mm-hmm. positive, positive, they repel, negative, negative, they repel. But you don't really see the force of what actually draws them together. It's just a, a thing that occurs. It's a natural thing. So what if that's sort of the thing too? Just the presence of whatever it is that's weird, causes this reaction with you somehow in a way that your brain can make it sort of work. Like it pulls upon your perceptions and what you anticipate you're going to see. Or Yeah. Or it has some kind of effect Yeah, where your brain starts to, to make it to where you can sort of maybe figure it out, comprehend it or whatever, mm, or even project what you might see. Yeah. Yeah. Or all of that stuff. Yeah. Not saying that, you know, Oh, you're just experiencing it in your mind and it's not real, but just, that that's just the reaction that your body makes, whether it's mentally or physi- physi- uh, physiologically, you know, it's just a reaction that you have, you know, whether it's like the whole flight or fight thing or any, you know what I'm saying? It's just sort of like, this is how you're going to experience it. It doesn't say that it's not a real thing or that you haven't actually experienced something, but this is what your body is going to do hmm. in reaction to this particular type of thing. Okay. You know, I don't know. Cause you, you get that right. Like spider sense. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. 
I went off like 10, 10 different little ways there to try to figure <laughs> out, you know, <laughs> but it's like, it's, it's, I call it like, it's like you, your body reacts in a way or whatever, because you're all of a sudden creeped out. Yeah. You can be scared. You can be out in the woods and be like, oh man, there's a bear and be freaked out. But you know, when you just get creeped out in this level, all your hair stands up, you know, and it's more of a visceral response type thing, you know, I don't that know. reaction. Like, yeah, like, like why do you get it for that stuff, but not for like a bear? I mean, we've gone out and seen bears and snakes and stuff, and it's like, you know, oh, hey, that's frightening. But then you go out in the woods and you're like, let's go to the car as fast as possible right freaking now. And that's an example. Not like you're worried about a cougar getting you, but you're like, you just know in your heart like, it's bad. Like when we share with listeners and other people our, our skinwalker experience, where we may have stumbled upon a skinwalker in the Southwest. And your first reaction was everybody get back to the van dogs, everybody let's get yeah, back let's to the go. van. And my reaction right. was let's hike further. And that's why you are the first to go in a horror movie. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I have to know the truth. It's not even about knowing the truth. I, I like when people go, well, if I seen this, I'd go right up to it. And it's like, you don't, you oh, will I, never have the correct experience. I would disagree. You would not be around to disagree. <laughs> you have to be respectful to the experience. I think going right up in there and your f- your fight or flight is different than my flight fright. Yeah, because mine fr- 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 has fr- to try to protect you and the stupid dog for doing <laughs> something stupid. <sighs> because see, I'm, I wasn't just thinking, oh, this may be a skinwalker. I was thinking, oh, this may be a crazy person. True. There's things called drugs and weirdos and stuff, right? Or like long hiking trail serial killers. Yeah. 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 Because, I mean, how many people have died on the Appalachian Trail that have been, you know, killed to death by serial killers? Yeah. There's, and one of the last, I stopped paying attention when it was like over 4,096 people have been, you know, lost and missing in national parks that aren't reported. And that was just in one freaking year. So, so I think it's okay to be able to pull back a little bit and go, let's evaluate the situation because the ones, the people that pull back and evaluate the situation to kind of see what's going on are typically the ones that can tell you later on, Hey man, here's what happened. Yeah. Are you one of these people who just jumps in the car and takes a trip? Or are you a person that says, let me make sure I have no jumper cables. I evaluate the situation as I go but my curiosity will rule me as well as my general, do I have a vibe to get out of here or not? Yeah, but if you don't have that vibe. I mean, I get it sometimes. Like when I would be like in the Southwest and I'd be like, okay, I know I am very close to a mountain lion. Let me get back down the trail. Yeah, but I mean, that's different. Or, you know, certain other things, certain other examples like, uh, our earlier podcast, we talked a lot about the Sandia Man Cave and how it had a weird vibe. Sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. But that goes to the southwest and an ill wind passing through phenomenon. Well, yeah, but I mean, I'm just saying. But that. if I don't have that vibe, instead I have a, I feel safe enough to investigate this, or I feel confident enough, I'm going to do it because curiosity does rule me. So... I just look at all the stuff that's there, all the clues, all the things that say, okay. You're also talking to a woman who's almost sat on a rattlesnake twice, so. (laughs) It's funny you bring up the rattlesnake thing. I've watched you almost sit on the dog like nine times. You you don't even look. (laughs) You know, you got to be aware of what's going on (laughs) and what's going down. And, you know, hey, if you're trying to investigate something, sure. Do what you got to do. But at the same time, though, if you get in a situation where you don't really know what's going to happen or what's happening, next thing you know, you eat a little piece of fairy cake and it's 400 years later and you can't get back. <laughs> You'll be the one that's been chewing on a Twinkie and I'll never see you again. Like, I have no idea where she went. Stop. It's true. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to step back and go, let me see what's going on here, man. Lots of clues. You cannot help it if a magical stranger in the forest offers me a shiny That's rock. exactly that why is, you don't that take is it. my weakness. Okay, first off, shiny magical person. <laughs> that should already tell you something's off. 
So you just got to be wired that way. You're wired to like, hey, the glass is like almost halfway full. Look at how much glass I have. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute. There's something wrong. This glass should be full. And it's not. I know enough not to spend all our money on magic beans. But it pretty much stops there. <laughs> That's the sound. People are like, you want to go see some UFOs? Absolutely. <laughs> Don't try to play it down, man. I'm telling you. You know what happens when you get gone, right? What? Nothing. Nobody knows. <laughs> Just saying. So on that happy note, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the podcast. <laughs> we do appreciate you listening. If you think Omi needs to, uh, you know, pay better attention. <laughs> what? <laughs> just let us know. Or if you have an Oz Factor experience or Eerie Silence experience, we want to hear about it. Again, that's going to be uh, 575 208 4025. Or you can write us contact at creekgeeks.com. Again, everything we've talked about, we have links in the show notes for each podcast episode, which you can find on whatever podcast player you listen to or directly on our website, creekgeeks.com. We do want to thank our Patreon supporters. We do have a short video available exclusively to them first about our trip to Medic Mountain State Park. Um, and some interesting tracks and other stuff we noticed about the park. Uh, our Patreon is going to be patreon.com forward slash creep geeks. And again, we do want to thank all our Patreon supporters. Yes. Yep. Find us on social media. We are trying to get that group and that page to grow. So go to the show notes, look for creep geeks on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and our Facebook group. Yes. You can find us there. Yep. All right, anyway, so there you go. Any questions, comments, concerns, please let us know. But you've been listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. This was episode number 216. Yeah. So, very, very nice. So, yeah, all right, that's it. That's all we got for now. Thanks. Okay, so anyway, see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.